So I get the honor today to introduce Dr. Michael Mithofer. Uh, he is triple board certified in psychiatry, internal medicine, and emergency medicine. Uh, he attended medical school at the Medical University of South Carolina uh, College of Medicine, where he also did psychiatry residency and is currently on the uh, psychiatry faculty. Um, he also did a medical residency at the University of Virginia. And uh, he practices psychiatry in Charleston, South Carolina, where he splits his time between uh, clinical research and outpatient clinical practice, specializing in treating patients with PTSD. Um, and I feel like I could, I could say a lot, but I think I'll, I'll kind of summarize and, and borrow a quote from a colleague, uh, James Henry, who introduced him last night, uh, who said that, um, this work really exemplifies um, one of the primary goals of psychiatry, which is to develop and utilize um, the best treatments for people with, with uh, mental disorders. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Mithofer. Thanks very much, Chris. I really appreciate you and UK arranging this. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, until yesterday, I never had a chance to speak at a VA before. I, I spoke at the Palo Alto VA yesterday, and now I'm here, which feels very exciting to me because for the last year, our main thrust of our research has been with veterans. So, you know, you're working with veterans every day here, and um, it's, I, I really hope we can have a conversation about this after I've done my slides. But it's been, uh, you know, I work with my wife, Annie, as co-therapist for this therapy. She's a psychiatric nurse. And we've been really grateful to have the chance to get to know this group of really remarkable young people, the veterans we've been working with. And we've been very struck by, you know, how much they've been suffering and also how much determination they've had to do their own healing. And also the really striking degree to which they're focused on wanting to heal help other veterans get the help they need. So it's, it's a very moving experience for us to begin working in this community. I, I was speaking to a, a veteran, a young man who is a Marine in Iraq, who finished the study, that, except for the long-term follow-up, finished most of the study about six months ago. And I was talking to him last week, and he said, um, you know, as bad as it was to be in Iraq, what was even worse for me was finding my, bat, my body back home, but my mind still in Iraq. And what I did in the study allowed me to bring the rest of me home. And I'm so aware of all the veterans whose bodies are here, but they're not fully home. And I know that you experience this every day. So I feel as if we're, we have a common purpose, what you're doing here and what we're trying to do to find the best possible array of treatments for people, veterans and other people suffering from PTSD. So I'm really, really grateful to have a chance to talk to you. Um, I am on the, I'm actually on the clinical faculty at the Medical University, but I want to give a disclaimer that the research is not happening at the university. Um, it's, we do it in my office and it's sponsored by MAPS, which is a private nonprofit. So, um, I don't have references on most of my slides, but this is a very good source. This is, was our original investigator's brochure for the FDA, and it's a, a review, literature review of all the English language literature on MDMA that Ilsa Jerome, who works for MAPS, updates a couple times a year. So it's a good source for um, references. So I'd like to just touch briefly on the history of MDMA, a little bit about its effects, why we thought it was a good idea to study MDMA for PTSD, and then tell you a little bit about our clinical trials. And you know, this is going to be kind of an overview, so I'm not going to give a huge amount of detail on the trials, but I'll try to give you kind of the nuts and bolts, and then and in the end talk a little more about our ongoing study with veterans. MDMA is a molecule that looks a little bit like methamphetamine and a little bit like mescaline, which kind of fits with its effects. I'm not much of a chemist, but that makes sense to me. Um, it's been off patent for since 1914. It was patented by Merck as a precursor drug, precursor compound, and never used by them. It was actually 
first synthesized 100 years ago in, in 1912. So it's off patent. Drug companies aren't interested in it. MAPS, is, our sponsor, is acting kind of like a nonprofit drug company to see if we can bring it through the drug, drug development stages of the FDA. And it's sometimes kind of lumped with other psychedelics, um, but it's, it's quite different from the classical psychedelics like LSD or psilocybin in that um, it tends to, Dave Nichols, a chemist at Purdue, has um, suggested the term intactogen, sort of referring to the fact that it sort of helps people touch within, their, get, be in touch with their own feelings and also more connection with other people, a greater sense of closeness to others and empathy. And, you know, in the literature, it says it, it um, tends to cause a, um, a kind of easily controlled state with little sense of loss of, loss of control. What we've seen with people with severe PTSD is that's not as true as you might think. Uh, often people with, with PTSD do experience a sen sense of losing control and fear about that. Um, and, you know, especially perhaps veterans who, for whom, you know, being at war was so much about vigilance and trying to be uh, under control. Un uncontrolled situations were uh, potentially lethal. So it's not, you know, that's something to take into account. It requires proper support to help people work with that. In some ways, being able to let go of control is an important part of the, the therapeutic process, but it, it's not easy necessarily. Um, you know, the pharmacological profile is quite complex. A lot of it has to do with monoamine release, especially serotonin, but also norepinephrine and dopamine. And it also has affinity for uh, some receptors, 5-HT2, also norepinephrine, ACTH, and histamine. And it increases levels of a number of hormones. Um, probably the most interesting in terms of the psychological effects are prolactin and oxytocin in that list. It's been classified in Schedule I since 1985. Um, before that, it was used by a number of psychiatrists and psychotherapists as an adjunct to therapy. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a legal drug, but it wasn't illegal either. It didn't have a status. So it was used. There were some case reports published, but no controlled trials were done. There was actually a three-month period when it was in Schedule Three during the legal proceedings when MAPS was suing the DEA for not following their own rules, but it ended up in Schedule One nonetheless. So, you know, MDMA has a certain amount of baggage as a, a compound to be doing research with because it already has a reputation, not all of which is favorable in many people's eyes. <laughs> so that's made part of this an uphill, uh, uphill effort. Um, but it also has an upside in that uh, a lot of governments around the world have spent a great deal of money studying MDMA because of its recreational use. So there were lots of there was lots of preclinical data. MAPS did actually contribute to a little bit of that, but there was also a lot of data that, that wasn't necessary to pay for in order to be in a position to move forward. Um, then there were, at the time we started our phase two trial, there had been a number of phase one trials. Um, uh, the first one was at UCLA by Charlie Grove, which was, uh, MAPS was sponsoring. But there were others around the US and in Europe, and there have been quite a few since then as well. So um, we were in a position to start out doing phase two. Obviously, the question of toxicity is important to touch on. It's a long and complicated subject, but just um, suffice it to say, it can, be there, it can be very serious acute toxicity, and people do die from it. It's, quite rare considering the large uh, number of doses that are taken, but it's still uh, something to be taken seriously. It can be dangerous in the wrong setting. Um, and in animal studies, um, there, there's evidence of changes in serotonin neurons with high doses. There's argument about how well that applies to humans and the doses that are used in humans. And, uh, 
in my opinion, the answer is it, it really doesn't apply much. The, there's a lot of, there have been a lot of studies of recreational users with kind of mixed results and mixed interpretations of those. You know, these studies are hard to interpret because they're retrospective. There has been one prospective trial in the Netherlands, but almost all of them are retrospective. You don't know what the pre MDMA functioning was, and you don't know if they took MDMA or what else they took. So it's difficult. But in the best studies, with the cleanest samples, the, the data is actually reassuring. They're, they didn't find much. What's most important to us is the data in phase one and phase two trials. And now there have been more than 500 people in phase one and phase two trials, and there have been no drug-related serious adverse events, no evidence of neurotoxicity, and we have some data from our first study about that that I'll show you. So, you know, it appears from this that the, like any drug, it's not without risk, but the risk-benefit ratio in, in the number of doses we're using of pure MDMA in well-screened people in controlled settings, the uh, risk-benefit ratio seems to be very favorable. Um, I think you know, I, I asked yesterday, does anybody here think we don't need more and better treatments for PTSD? Didn't think so. Um, you know, there are some good treatments. It, we certainly have some, some things we can offer people. Uh, prolonged exposure and CPT probably being the best researched. And also, you know, the recognized therapies by the American Psychiatric Association also include psychodynamic therapy and EMDR. And there are lots of pharmacotherapies, only two drugs with FDA indication, sertraline and paroxetine, but many, as you know well, many other drugs are used. Um, but overall, if you look at even in the best hands in clinical trials uh, of specific therapies, if you account for dropouts, I say conservatively 25 to 50 percent of people are not adequately served by these therapies, and I think the real-world clinical situation is worse than that. And um, so that's, a, you know, several million people in the U.S. alone every year. And as you're very well aware, the incidence of PTSD in, in veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan is, is really um, alarmingly high. It's hard to pin the number down, but it's probably around at least 18%. And uh, in a study from here by Dr. Seal et al., um, they found, I'm sure you know this, uh, in the people that screened positive for PTSD here at the San Francisco VA, fewer than 10% uh, received what they considered to be optimal treatment. So, and that's certainly from not from lack of trying. <laughs> you know, I, I know that. So, it, but it's just a very, very challenging problem, and we need we need to add to this list of possible therapies with more and more effective ones. So why MDMA for PTSD? Well, you know, I think we'd probably also all agree that psychopharmacology does not cure PTSD. The drugs may help with some of the symptoms, but it seems pretty clear that psychotherapy is extremely important for PTSD. So you know, why, doesn't, why does it work sometimes and not other times? Well, that's very complex, but I think um, common reasons are either um, fear, anxiety, that people either get so overwhelmed by revisiting the trauma and therapy that they won't do it, or, or they're flooded, what Edna Foa with um, prolonged exposure would call over-engaged so the therapy doesn't work. Or conversely, they have so much emotional numbing uh, that they may be able to report the trauma, talk about it, but they don't engage emotionally so the therapy doesn't work. I'm sure you all see that every day. Um, and so those are two big reasons for psychotherapy not being effective. And the other factor is people with PTSD uh, can have a lot of problem with trust and that interferes with the therapeutic alliance. So if there's a compound that can decrease fear and defensiveness and increase trust and empathy, it makes sense that that might help to overcome some of these obstacles to effective therapy. That was our thinking. 
And an additional effect is, you know, so overcoming those kind of would allow people to reprocess the trauma in therapy. An additional effect, we think, is that um, at least part of the time people with MDMA, people usually have some affirming uh, sort of positive experiences, which can help them correct kind of negatively skewed uh, perception of the world and their situation. So that can also, is a potential way it could help. Um, this is taken from Pat Ogden's, Ogden's book, uh, Trauma and the Body. It kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. So, you know, this isn't a new idea that fear and, or defensiveness can interfere with therapy. This is like a level of arousal with hyperarousal up here, increased emotional reactivity, intrusive imagery, disorganized cognitive processing, and hypoarousal down here, absence of sensation and numbing of emotions, disabled cognitive processing. And as you know, people with PTSD are prone to being at both of these, one or the other of these ends of the arousal spectrum. So this zone in the middle, the window of tolerance or optimal arousal zone, is where therapeutic processing can happen. So, and that, you know, this is described with other kinds of therapy. But our thinking is that MDMA seems to give people um, several hours in which it brings them into this optimal arousal zone or window of tolerance so they can process the trauma in ways that they might not have been able to before in therapy. And of course, there are lots of ways to look at this. You know, our studies are not designed to figure out why it works. The FDA doesn't really care, luckily, or we wouldn't have many psychiatric medicines if we had to show how they work, <laughs> but they care whether they work or not. So we're focused on, on finding out whether we can show that they work, but we're, of course, very interested in how they might be working. So this neurocircuitry model of PTSD, in which you know, it's viewed as a deficit in extinction of fear conditioning, kind of fits with what I'm talking about, too. And we know that in people with PTSD, um, it's been found that they have, um, you know, well, the, the, fear, the extinction of fear conditioning is mediated by hippocampus, amygdala, and prefrontal cortex interactions. And we know that people with PTSD have uh, increased activity in the amygdala, reduced hippocampal volume and activity, and decreased activation of the medial prefrontal cortex. That's PTSD. In a separate population of normal volunteers, it was found that MDMA causes some changes sort of opposite of that. Um, increases in cerebral blood flow in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and elsewhere, and decreases of activity in the left amygdala. No one has studied people with PTSD before and after MDMA with imaging. We would like, love to do that. We've been trying to do it. Um, I think a, like a good VA hospital would be a good place to do <laughs> such a thing. <laughs> so, but this sort of would fit with the, the idea that MDMA could put people in a position to process things more effectively and extinguish fear conditioning. So this was our first study, uh, phase two clinical trial, the safety and efficacy of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in people with treatment-resistant PTSD. We got original FDA approval for this in 2001, and then it took us until uh, that was the fall of 2001. It took us until February 2004 to get IRB and DEA approvals. And that's kind of a story in itself, but the, suffice it to say the DEA was not over eager to expedite the approval of this, but they really didn't have a choice once the FDA had approved it. Uh, and we've actually had very, I'm sorry? Actually, it's probably a normal time frame. Is it? Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway. The fact is we were able to get approval and we have a good working relationship with FDA and DEA. Um, so a month later we enrolled our first subject and then we finished in September 2008 and published the results in Journal of Psych Psychopharmacology in 2010. So our hypothesis was that we could safely administer MDMA to people with chronic uh, PTSD and that it would produce improvement in PTSD symptoms four days after each of two or three, actually each of two experimental sessions, 
with MDMA assisted therapy and a, a two month follow up. So we screened 134 people on the phone, 27 people in person in order to enroll and randomize 23. Uh, we had two dropouts, so 21 people completed it, and 13 were randomized to MDMA, eight were randomized to placebo. That was what we call stage one of the protocol. And then in stage two, the people who got placebo could elect to go through it again with open label. It was an open label crossover arm. They could go back through the whole process of the therapy and MDMA. It was double blind placebo controlled. We actually had 20 treatment resistant subjects, which was our original number. We added a 21st subject, a veteran at the end, who had not had treatment because when he was on active duty as a Marine officer, he went to the medical officer and was sent to an outside contract therapist and told he had depression to take Zoloft. And he said, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and he actually had classic PTSD. So we were, got permission to include him just so we get more experience with veterans. But he's not included in the data I'm going to show you because he, he hadn't been shown to be treatment resistant. It, the Department of Defense was treatment resistant, I, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, and we defined that as having had at least three months of treatment with, with an SSRI or SNRI and at least six months of psychotherapy. In fact, most people had had years of therapy and many medications because the, the duration of PTSD in this cohort was more than 19 years before they entered the study. Originally, it was all crime-related PTSD, and that's what most of the subjects were, uh, childhood sexual abuse or rape, because we just added veterans at the very end. So there's only one veteran in the 20. Uh, but in our current study, it's all veterans, which I'll show you in a minute. So the protocol was in stage one, 60% would receive MDMA on two or three occasions, and 40% would receive placebo on two or three occasions, on two occasions. The reason it's two or three with the MDMA is that we amended the protocol halfway through because it was a pilot study and we added a third session. But the data I'm going to show you is based on two sessions. We did have some further improvement with the third session, but we stuck with our original design of 20, you know, two placebo versus two MDMA sessions. So all the data I'm going to show you is based on that. Then stage two, as I said, was an open label crossover arm. And when people went through the whole thing again with open label MDMA, um, there was no take home MDMA. This is a, a treatment in which people receive <laughs> There's always a kind of a disappointment in the crowd when I say that. <laughs> uh, this was, the MDMA was given on, only under direct supervision with male and female therapists present the whole time for at least eight hours. In this case, myself and my wife as male and female therapy team. And then there's an overnight stay in the, in the clinic with a nurse on do, present. Um, the initial dose was uh, 125 milligrams, followed by half of that, an optional supplemental dose two hours later. And an important point is there were a lot of uh, non-drug therapy sessions. We, we thought it was extremely important to prepare people well for the experience. Um, we'd meet with them twice for 90 minutes before their first session, and then to uh, follow them closely with integration sessions to help them integrate the experience because this is not like a magic bullet where you just, you're better. It's a process and, and it's, it can, people can have waves of increased difficult emotions during the therapeutic process that continues to unfold after the session. So we would meet with them the next morning before they went home, call them every day on the phone for a week and meet with them every week approximately for a month until the next session. So the MDMA or placebo sessions were all day sessions a month apart, and the integration sessions occurred in between. And we measured the blood pressure and pulse every 15 minutes and the temperature every hour during the MDMA or placebo sessions. Uh, we were not, but we are now. We, we now, in our current vet study, got permission from the FDA to cover up the uh, blood pressure and pulse monitor, but for the first study, we had to 
had to watch it. So uh, there was a problem with the blind being transparent. I'll, I'll talk more about that, but we were able to guess what people got. The independent raider was effectively blinded, remained effectively blinded, but we were actually, um, you know, we tracked this. We, we didn't kind of want to, we didn't have a don't ask, don't tell policy about the, the blind the way some drug studies do. We had to record whether we thought they, what they, we thought they got, and we'd ask them what they got and we'd record it. And it did turn out that we always guessed correctly between inactive placebo and MDMA. And usually the subjects guessed correctly. A couple times they were wrong. But that was, that's a challenge we're trying to work with now in our current studies. This is where we do the sessions. Um, the therapist sit on either side and the um, participant either lies or sits on the futon. It's a nice kind of aesthetically pleasing, very private room. There's a bathroom right behind that blue chair so people don't have to interact with any other people or spaces while they're having their MDMA or placebo. You know, we call it placebo sessions kind of as a shorthand. It really should be called therapy only. You know, this is not just a drug trial. It's a drug-assisted psychotherapy trial. So when I say placebo, I mean therapy only, because all the people who got placebo got all the same all-day sessions, the same follow-up sessions. Um, so the therapeutic approach was a non-directive approach aimed at supporting the emerging experience of the person. You know, and what happens, uh, somebody asked last night, well, what about do you ever do prolonged exposure? The answer is prolonged exposure, imaginal exposure, almost always happens, but we don't do it. We don't decide now you should uh, tell us the, the trauma script or read the trauma script. We encourage people to see what's going to come up for them, and at some time, inevitably, they start processing the trauma, and there will be periods of time that are sort of like spontaneous prolonged exposure happening. There will be other times when there's kind of spontaneous uh, psychodynamic therapy happening. People will start talking about their childhood and things that made them uh, susceptible to PTSD, perhaps, and they'll make connections and um, interpret those things for themselves. You know, sometimes, certainly, we interact and give them a little guidance or suggestions, but we don't direct it to go in one direction or the other. But what happens is many of the elements of existing therapies tend to happen on spontaneously. People have, you know, cognitive restructuring happens spontaneously. People will have just suddenly realized that their view of something was, didn't make sense, and they're able to think of it a different way. So it's actually in some ways not so um, foreign to people who've done other therapy because a lot of the elements that you recognize as being important in other therapies tend to happen spontaneously with the MDMA. But they seem to often happen in, in, in kind of a deeper way where they come more quickly than they might otherwise. Um, and, you know, the, it's, we're not talking to them all the time. We encourage people to spend part of the time focusing inward without talking, usually with eye shades and headphones listening to music if they're comfortable with that. And then we alternate that with periods of talking to us. And we don't have any set schedule for that, but um, a, a rhythm kind of develops for each person. And, you know, sometimes if we've been talking for a while, uh, we might say to somebody, you know, if it feels right to you, this might be a good time to go back inside for a while. Or sometimes they will have been talking for us, a while, for us, talking to us for a while, and they'll say, "I think this would be a good time to go back inside now." And they'll pull their eye shades back down, lie down, and go inside. So, it seems to be a, a good way of working that sort of unfolds spontaneously. We've now written a treatment manual describing this. It's quite different from a lot of treatment manuals in that it's there's more leeway for the therapist's own intuition and and particular ways of working, but there are certain elements that are essential that we've described in the manual, and we have adherence measures, and we now have independent raters watching our videos, because we videotape everything, and now we can establish whether we are actually following our manual uniformly 
across sessions and across different studies. This is an important point. A number of people said thing, this exact thing or something like this. I don't know why they call this ecstasy. So the point is, as I said before, people didn't just come in and have a blissful experience and then everything was fine. Usually people had some periods of very affirming experiences. Sometimes you might call them blissful. But much of the time, it was hard work and painful. You know, People were there to process their trauma. Uh, they would encounter a lot of, of, of difficult emotions, you know, rage, shame, fear, grief. Uh, so the MDMA didn't spare them from that. In fact, it often helped them reach those feelings when they had previously been emotionally numbed. But when they did come, the MDMA has a tendency, we think, to give people the sense that, okay, this is hard, but I can do it in a way that they often reported they'd never been able to do before in therapy. Our outcome measures are all done by a psychologist not involved in the treatment phase. These are our outcome measures. The primary outcome measure was the clinician administered PTSD scale, the CAPS. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. That was the primary outcome measure for the paroxetine and sertraline trials that led to FDA <coughs> indication. So we thought it was important to use that. It's also probably the best measure. And then we also did the IES, the SCL90, and the NEO. And in a nutshell, here's what we found in this first study. Um, these are the mean CAP scores two from baseline, which is time measurement one, to f two months, time measurement four. Time two is four days after the first MDMA placebo session. Time three is four days after the second session. The CAP scores on the vertical axis. A score of 50 or more was required for study entry. So you can see the placebo group in blue actually had this was statistically significant decrease in CAP scores from, they, they both had almost identical scores of just under 80. And the placebo group with these all day sessions and all the therapy did improve, but they still had significant symptoms. Whereas as you can see, the MDMA group, as soon as four days after the first session had a dramatic drop in CAPs, which increased to maintain a spread of about 33 points better than placebo, 50 plus points better than baseline, and that P was 0.015 between group difference. Um, then stage two, as I said, um, people would cross over to open label MDMA if they got placebo uh, with all, this, all the integration sessions that go with it. Seven of eight placebo people elected to do this. The one who didn't was a placebo responder who had a good response to the placebo sessions and didn't feel she needed any more. Here's what we found with that crossover. Um, CAP score on the vertical axis, baseline post placebo. So after two therapy only all day sessions plus the other therapy, the mean CAPS was 65.6. Two months, again, over 30 point drop to 33.9. So having not responded to therapy only, they responded to MDMA with therapy in a similar way as the other people had responded. So when we looked at clinical response, which we defined as greater than 30% reduction in CAPS, it's a pretty common way to define that. The psychotherapy only had a 25% response, MDMA 83%, and in the crossover, placebo to MDMA, it was 100%. We did neuropsychological testing before and after MDMA or placebo. The main one was the R bands. Um, the results for all three were similar, about the same. Here are the R bands results. R band score on the vertical axis where higher is better. MDMA, dark bars before, light bars after, placebo before and after, no sign of any neuropsychological. Um, problems from MDMA. So then we went back and we, we had obviously good results at two months. We wondered, are these going to last? So we went back and did a long-term follow-up. One year or more after completion, we repeated the CAPS, IES, NEO, and, and gave people a questionnaire. The CAPS was administered by the same 
psychologist that did the original CAPS. And here's what we found there. This was the baseline CAPS. This was the two-month CAPS. And this was the 45-month CAPS. It, because we started the long-term follow-up at, at the end, and our recruitment had happened over more than four years, uh, it ended up being a range of 74 to four, 17 to 74 months after the last MDMA session, mean of 45 months. So this was very encouraging, but there is a caveat. You'll notice the N is 20 for these two, and the N is 16 here, because not everyone did the caps. You know, the first thing was not only 19 people were included in long-term follow-up because one person had never gotten MDMA. Um, so of the 19, 16 did the CAPS. Uh, they all did the questionnaire, but only 16 ended up doing the CAPS for various reasons. So if you just look at the 16, it's about 87% um, of people maintain their scores. Um, two people did relapse to CAPS over 50. But it's fair to say, well, how do you know that the three that didn't take the CAPS didn't relapse? And we don't. We do have an indication that they didn't because they did the questionnaire and they, their responses about benefit and maintain, maintenance of benefit were uh, very similar to the overall group. But that's not a standardized measure. But even if you assume that those three relapsed, so you had five people relapsing and the rest maintaining, that's still 74% of people uh, maintaining uh, their benefits three and a half years later. Um, so our current activities, we now have a training program for research therapists, people who are working in other studies. And uh, it's based on the manual, and we use a lot of video from our sessions. And we thought, because now we do, I'll show you the other studies that MAPS has going on that we're involved in. But we thought it would be really good if, if the therapists had a chance to have their own experience with MDMA so they understand better what's going on. So we got FDA permission for a phase one trial that's um, <coughs> enrollment is limited to people who have finished our training program and are, are working or going to work on research projects. Um, but they're allowed to have their own MDMA session in the same setting, that same room with us there, so that they have that experience. So far, we've had two therapists who have been through that. We're also doing a relapse study. We thought we wondered whether those people that relapsed um, three and a half years later in the first study would respond to kind of like a booster session. So we have permission to give them one session to see if they can regain their, their gains. And one person has done that so far, and uh, she, in fact, did have a very good response to that. Uh, and now we're applying our manual and adherence measures to all, all our current studies. So the other things that are happening in the MAPS MDMA PTSD world is a study very much like ours in Switzerland, a little bit smaller numbers, has been completed and is um, being written now for publication, uh, a study in Israel was recently initiated. These are all uh, MDMA PTSD studies. Uh, studies in Colorado, Vancouver, and Australia are in the um, approval process. So is one in Jordan. And there's activity in England to try to develop a protocol there. So those are all MDMA PTSD studies. And there is an open protocol now at Harvard for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for um, end-of-life anxiety. And then this is what we're mainly working on now, our new study of veterans with PTSD that's currently underway in Charleston. And this time, it's a dose-response design attempting to deal with that blinding problem that we were talking about. So it's um, comparing three different doses. And it's actually open now to veterans, firefighters, and police officers, although so far it's been all veterans. And it's very much like the first study, except for the change in the doses. Um, it's open to 24 veterans, firefighters, and police officers, same cutoff. They have to have a CAPS of greater than 50. This time, instead of being after psychotherapy and uh, drug treatment, it, ha it has to be either or, psychotherapy or 
medication for PTSD. Part of the reason for that is um, it seems that in VA, in the VA system, a lot of times people don't get a lot of psychotherapy. Is that true here? Anyway, the veterans we've encountered usually haven't had much psychotherapy, but they've usually had uh, psychopharmacology. So we, we're using 30, 75, and 125 milligrams, each followed by half of that dose in the same eight-hour MDMA sessions, the same very similar schedule of pr preparation and integration sessions as the same first study. And this is an attempt to find a level, a dose of MDMA that will act as an active placebo, basically, to see if we can fool ourselves better, um, but still have a dose that doesn't work so well, but we get fooled by. I'm not sure we're doing that, but that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then we do, after the second session, similar to the first design, um, stage one, we measure the outcome measures after the second session and break the blind, and then Stage two looks like this. If they got full dose twice in the first, in stage one, then they get a third full dose session. If they got lower medium dose in the stage one, they get three full dose sessions. So everybody ends up with three full dose sessions. And we do follow up measures two months and one year. And um, so far we've enrolled nine veterans, five have completed all the sessions. We've had two dropouts, um, which has been interesting. One veteran dropped out early on after one medium dose session. And the reason he dropped out is he said he didn't need any more, because he was better. And his CAPS was dramatically better. And the other thing he said about it was, um, during the session, he got the insight that the OxyContin that he said he was using for his back, he was actually using to make himself feel better emotionally and he didn't need or want to do that anymore. So he came out of the session saying, I realize I don't want anything from the outside to change my, the way I'm feeling. I can talk about this now. I can deal with it by talking about it. I don't need that. And he stopped taking OxyContin that day and didn't want any more MDMA. But he did agree to continue in the follow-up, so I'll show you his follow-up results after one session. The other dropout, um, unfortunately, it was somebody who got low dose and had such a hard time being faced with all that time in which there was nothing happening except the possibility of him focusing on his inner experience. It was too hard for him. He wasn't willing to go on. Um, it's been six men, one woman with combat trauma, all from Iraq, two women with, women with mili military sexual trauma, and now we're, uh, in the, we're about to enroll uh, a Vietnam veteran, another man from Iraq, and another woman with MST. Um, it's been, in a way, heartbreaking, but um, good for recruitment, that without, having to, without trying to recruit, we've had 220 veterans call us asking about being in the study from all over the country. I'm sure it's more now. That was when I left home, and we usually, most days, we get at least one call. So they're calling much faster than we can enroll them. Um, so it's way too early to draw any conclusions, but I'll just give you a little flavor of what we're seeing so far. These first six people, um, you can see uh, three people had uh, a response to quite low, very low CAP scores. Two people had a quite a big drop, but still above 50. Um, this is the one year, this is baseline. These are the intermediate follow-ups, and this is one year. So we've only had two people do one year. This green line is the, the veteran who only had one dose. So two months later, his caps had gone from like 85 to just over 20. And when he came back for one year follow-up, it was uh, 24. And um, this one is that somebody who has had three sessions now, but this is after his two sessions, and we don't have his, we're about to get his follow-up. And what happened, he reported that he was doing quite a lot better, and then 10 days before he came back for his measures, a, a number of people in his National Guard unit from his hometown were killed, and a lot of people were wounded. So he had just come from a funeral. 
uh, when he came back for his testing. So we think maybe um, he's going to show improvement next time from what he's telling us. Um, we also did the back depression inventory this time. And you, see, you can see what we found. Um, one person had a score of over 30, just under 40, and that didn't change. The other two people with fairly high scores had um, considerable drops to 20 or below. And the three people that were low already stayed low. There wasn't any sign it was increasing depression. Uh, the GAF, global assessment of functioning, um, this is the same person that didn't improve on the back. This is the same person that had just been to the funeral. And the others had, had some definite increase in their GAF. We also, in the first study, we felt people were telling us about a lot of ways that helped them that weren't captured on the, with the standard measure. So we decided to add the post-traumatic growth inventory um, to see if we could capture some of this other change. And one, the same person did not have any increase in post-traumatic growth, but everybody else had a rather robust increase in post-traumatic growth um, after their sessions. So now, you know, all this is aimed at moving into phase three clinical trials, which are what two, the FDA requires two phase, clinical, phase three trials, which will have to be two or 300 people each in order to apply for labeling for a, a new drug. So that's what we're aiming for. This is gonna be a little while in the future. Um, at least one will be in the US, maybe two. Perhaps one will be in one of these other countries where we're doing studies. But we're really hoping one might happen at a VA someplace. So please keep that in mind. <laughs> so thank you very much. I, that's all I have to say, and I'd like to have some discussion. Thank you. And, and also, Rick Doblin is here, the president of MAPS. And if there are questions about kind of the overall drug development strategy, Rick is very good at answering those. We're going to open it up for, um, for questions. And I saw a hand. Dr. Botke. Thanks for a really um, very interesting presentation. And um, I missed the first minute, so you probably mentioned your funding. But that was one question. Another question is, have you applied for uh, federal funding, for NIH funding specific? And if you did, what kind of reviews did you get? Were there uh, critiques the, that might yeah, be of interest? The funding is all um, from. MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is a private nonprofit that gets money from membership, individual donations, and family foundations. We did apply for an INH grant for our manual development, and we did not get that. Rick, do you have more details about their response? <clears throat> yeah, um, we, we were told that we didn't have enough pilot data at the time that we applied. And, um, David Nutt, who was the drug policy advisor in England, has spoken to Tom Insel, who's the head of NIMH. And Tom used to do MDMA neurotoxicity research like 20 years ago. And he says that they might be open to considering something, but we haven't got around to applying yet. I'm aware of some other groups um, that are looking at psilocybin for, for this type of treatment and was wondering if you could speak to the different types of psychedelics and you know, which ones are indicated for certain disorders and could speak more generally about that. Yeah, well, I, I, the, there is a lot of exciting work quite a bit now with psilocybin. Um, psilocybin for end of life anxiety uh, at UCLA and Johns Hopkins and NYU. Um, and also the psilocybin and spiritual experience studies at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, there um, are no, M, no psilocybin PTSD studies going on. That would probably be interesting to do, although our feeling is MDMA is probably better suited for um, PTSD. But I, I think um, many of these compounds really deserve further study. You know, they were. They were studied, psilocybin and LSD were studied uh, in the 50s and 60s 
and had some really good data. So we're, that seems to be growing too. I think that, you know, we've talked quite a bit with the, some of the researchers that are doing the psilocybin studies and um, the, the sessions are different in that there's less, less talking during the sessions, but it's a very similar approach of preparing people and then helping them integrate it afterwards. I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, there's one thing. The, the classic psychedelics are more likely to produce a spiritual experience, and so that makes it m more effective, possibly, for the people who have anxiety about dying. Um, in this particular study uh, with MDMA, we've noticed that some people still do have spiritual experiences, and we did have an MDMA study, Michael mentioned, at Harvard with cancer patients, and we also have recently completed an LSD study in Switzerland with uh, end of life. But what we've noticed is that the spiritual experience does not seem to be correlated with reductions in the caps. So some people have had a spiritual experience, some people have not, and they both still seem to be getting better. Whereas with the psilocybin studies, they, they use the states of consciousness questionnaire, which we're also using now, and they did find a high correlation between results and strength of spiritual experience. And we're, we're tracking that formally now with the VET study, but we don't think it's important in the same way with MDMA. It may be very important for an individual, but overall not necessary. Um, I was certainly impressed by the, uh, the results in the long-term follow-up, and I may have missed this, but was curious as to what kind of treatment those patients were getting in between the, in the interval between the end of your study and the 45 months right, longer. Yeah. And we didn't control for that, but we did track that. We're, we, our, that paper should be coming out soon. We're about to send our final revisions in next week, but um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. What we found was that uh, people, some people were still in psychotherapy or taking psychopharmacology. About um, the rate, you know, everybody had had both of those, but at study entry, a little over 80% of people were in psychotherapy and at long-term follow-up, it was about 40%. So the, amount, the number in therapy had dropped to about half. The number in having psychopharmacology was about the same. The average number of drugs was smaller, but there still were people using antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs. And you know, I, I'm, I'm saying in our paper that perhaps that's analogous to the way you know, people might be unresponsive to, to antidepressants, they get ECT, they're better, but then they need antidepressants to maintain it, even though they didn't respond to them first. So maybe it's kind of analogous to that. Um, oh, um, I just wanted to add, I think there was a few other people that reported using marijuana. Yeah. We were there. So we actually have FDA permission for a study of marijuana in 50 US veterans for post-traumatic stress disorder, but the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana, has refused to sell us any so that that study won't be taking place. But our general view is that marijuana is something that can help control symptoms, but it doesn't really offer the possibility of a cure, and it needs to be used chronically for an extended period of time, whereas MDMA does have that potential of actually moving people past the PTSD. Hi, Mike. Um, Hi. I enjoyed it so much I came back again. Uh, <laughs> Great. The, uh, your uh, p-value is 0 0.015 on the initial control group and then 0 0.05. Um, do you have an effect size and number needed to treat? Um, yeah. Um, the effect size is just over one. Yeah. Or psychotherapy that comes close, is there? Well, I, I should also add, too, that the effect size was almost exactly the same in the Swiss study as in the U.S. study. Hi, thank you very much for your research. I appreciate the goals here for sure. I was wondering, the question you're bringing up around the placebo and the expectancy effect, you know, of having a deeply spiritual altered experience. I mean, I do some prolonged exposure work with veterans and certainly the more engaged they are emotionally, you know, the more impact the treatment has. And I was wondering for the placebo folks, what what were the sessions like, knowing that they didn't get the magic pill? Yeah. Uh, the sessions, usually, 
um, involved a period of a certain amount of disappointment, uh, except for a couple people who thought they'd gotten it and had quite deep experiences just from the set and setting and the expectancy effect. Um, but then uh, they weren't as different as you might think. They tended to be less deep and less intense, but we really made an effort to work in the same way and encourage people to take advantage of the time. And actually, everybody um, you know, in the first study with inactive placebo said, in retrospect, they were really glad they had those placebo sessions, even though they were disappointed at the time. They found them useful, uh, but not in the same way. So with the low-dose sessions, we're actually finding people uh, experience them as being more difficult. The low dose seems to bring up a little, you know, be a little activating and bring up a little more material and a little anxiety without really helping them over the hump, so to speak. So we actually started out with three low dose sessions and we changed the protocol to two because we found people were finding them too difficult. Well, but you did have one responder. We had one person who responded not to two, but the three, after the, by, yeah, responded to three low-dose sessions, had a really difficult time with two, but then, in a way, it was a different mechanism. It brought up stuff, it was very difficult, there was a lot of uh, intense transference, uh, anger about, you know, what we were doing to her, and then we were able to work with that in therapy, that the follow-up sessions were really aimed at, at processing that, and, and of course, that was part of her overall process. So that ended up being helpful. So it was almost like a different mechanism, not, a, not as appealing, uh, harder on people, not as fast, but maybe actually potentially useful. Thanks so much. Thank you.